It's a good day, church. Welcome to Worship Online with St. Luke United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Bonnie Howe. We'd love it if you would let us know that you're joining us by sending us a quick note in the comments. If you have family or friends joining with you, please go ahead and let us know who's with you this morning. We're continuing our series, Hitting the Books. We've asked a number of St. Luke family members to share their own messages of how a book has shaped or challenged or help to grow their faith. Today, we are blessed to hear from Lance Pyburn. Lance is an entrepreneur, a blogger, and a massage therapist. He's chosen to talk about the book, Traveling Mercies, some thoughts on faith by Anne Lamott. We gather together in our homes, across the country, maybe even around the world, to praise God and to grow together in love and relationship. Friends, let's join together in the call to worship. Every day, hearts and bodies are breaking. Every day, the suffering of God's people continues. Though we will not turn away from the struggle, we wonder and we cry and we lament. Will power remain in the arms of the wicked forever? Will racism and anti-blackness go on perpetually? Will money ever cease to be valued over people? Every day, the choice is before us. It doesn't have to be this way. Who will we be? What kind of lives will we live? What justice will we seek? With faith, let us worship together. May the Spirit come and shape us in truth and freedom divine. Amen. Friends, take a moment as we listen to the prelude played by Adam to center, to reflect on God's mercy in your life. Let us join together in prayer. Holy Wisdom, we bring into your presence the fullness of who we are, the hurting parts, the regrets, the murky and the messy. We have been wounded and we've wounded others. With courage and humility, we seek your guidance in the mending of the worlds between us and within us. Amen. Let's join together as we sing our hymn of praise this morning, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. Jesus. 
just keep me from my wrong I'll be satisfied as long As I walk, let me walk close to thee Jesus is my plea Daily walking close to Thee Let it be, dear Lord Let it be Through this world of toils and snares If I falter, Lord, who cares? Who with me my burden shares? And but thee, dear Lord, and but thee. Jesus is my plea Daily walking close to Thee Let it be, dear Lord Let it be And when my time on earth is o'er Time for me will be no more Guide me gently, safely o'er To thy kingdom shore To thy shore Just a closer walk with thee Jesus is my plea Daily walking close to Thee Let it be, dear Lord Let it be Let it be, dear Lord Let it be As we turn to God in prayer, to pray for one another, to pray for our family and friends, to pray for our world. Friends, you are invited to share your prayer requests in the comments and we will pray alongside with you. We also will add them to our weekly epistle. It's a newsletter and so we can be in prayer with you throughout the week. God hears our prayers and cares for us all deeply. Let us pray. Loving and merciful God, we come before you this day fresh from a week in which we have been challenged. Some of the challenges have caused us worry and strife. Other challenges bring to us clear direction for our lives. In all of this, you are with us, bringing healing and peace for our lives. We offer to you the names of all those who are ill, who mourn, who feel lost and alienated, wondering if anyone cares about them. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Bring your healing mercies to all these people we've named in our hearts and with our voices. We also bring to you, loving God, names and situations of great joy and celebration. For you have been in our midst during these times, as well as during the difficult times. Hear our praises, O God. Bring your loving presence to all these people we have named with our hearts and our voices. For it is in confidence of your abiding love and mercy that we offer this prayer. 
and the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us join together our hymn of prayer, I Need Thee Every Hour. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord, no tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee every hour I need thee. Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour. Stay Thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when Thou art nigh. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee, and I need What makes a community loving is not a lack of mistakes. It's what we do after we inevitably wrong one another. A loving community is honest, it learns, and it grows, and it seeks to mend through truth and justice and change. With God's help, we practice these in this place. Friends, I wanted to share with you a recording that I did earlier this week of Jack and his grandmother, Joanne. They volunteered this past weekend at Hope Food Pantry. This is a ministry that we've been supporting since its inception, helping to alleviate food insecurity in our community. I spoke with Jack and his grandma earlier via Zoom, and so here's that video. Hi, Jack. How are you today? I'm good. Good. I am great. Jack, you volunteered this past weekend at Hope Food Pantry. Was that your first time volunteering? Yes. Was it? Uh, I met a year ago. You volunteered a year that ago? Was second, that was my second time last week. And were you excited to volunteer? Yes. Why? Because it's fun helping people and getting to work with other people. Mm -hmm. Did you go with your family or did you go with your grandma? My grandma. Yeah. What was some of the things that you got to do on Saturday? Like the schedule everyone did. Yeah, what did you do? What was what was the day like for you? The first part of the day, for a while, um, the other helpers or volunteers would get all the donations, put it in a bag, 
and then and then they would bring it to put it on the table in another room where me and grandma were working. We would sort it into different piles. It was mostly canned stuff. So we'd put it into different piles. Like there's a bean pile. There was um, a veggie pile. There's a fruit pile. Mini piles. And then after all the donate, and then after we put all the stuff, like after they got all the donations done with put in to their places, uh, we would start getting bags, filling the bags with like we had a list of items that we would need to put in a bag. And the list had lots of different stuff, like beans, fruit, vegetables, and other stuff, and meat, and other stuff. And then once the bag was, we did all the tasks, like all the stuff that was on the that was on the list. We we would get the bag that was full, and we would put it on the shelf with wheels. And once the shelf got full, another volunteer would take it out to another part of the place building and that built and that part had like a big table or two tables like a movable one and they would unstack the shelf put the bags there and then people it was like nearby the door like the room was next to the door where you enter the building and they would come in and grab a bag depending on how big their family is they would grab one or two um, your grandma told me that you really, really enjoyed volunteering. Yes. And I wonder if you were going to invite other people from St. Luke to volunteer, what would you tell them about it? How would you convince them? Um, you get to you get to work with other volunteers if you want to talk and work, or and you could help you could help other people in need. Mm-hmm. I wonder, did you have enough food for everybody? Or did you run out or? At some point we ran out, but at that point we had lots and lots of bags filled with food for lots of people. How can people support Hope Food Pantry? By helping donating food. Would you like to volunteer again? Yes. Yeah. How many people were there about volunteering? Do you remember? About eight. About eight people? Not too many people. I only remember that because my grandma said that. Yeah, it doesn't need very many people to volunteer, but just a few people make a big difference, don't they? Yes. Yeah, yeah. We got a lot done. Is there anything else you want us to know about your time volunteering at Hope Food Pantry? It's a lot of fun, and you get to, if you want to, you get to talk with the volunteers and help other people in need. Mm-hmm. Cool. Thanks so much, Jack. I appreciate you taking the time to make this video with me. No problem. Awesome. Awesome. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. I love Jack's enthusiasm. He really expressed a great joy for volunteering. Beloved community, we appreciate all of your support for all of the efforts of St. Luke to bring about God's peace, hope, love, and justice in the world. We thank you for your faithful generosity as you share your prayers your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. We encourage you to sign up for our newsletter so that you can receive our prayer list and be informed of the upcoming service opportunities and just share in the life of St. Luke. And you can support our ministries giving through our website at www.stlukeaustin.com or mailing your support to St. Luke at 1306 West Lynn Street in Austin, Texas. Our zip code is 78703. Let us pray. Just and compassionate one, as we bring our offerings, we remember that economic oppression is one of the great and ongoing violences of our world, still so far from redemption. Guide our practices, individual and collective, in the stewardship of our resources. May we be faithful in sharing, redistributing, and disrupting the systems of exploitation that harm us all in body and spirit. Amen. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice, let us rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it.
closer to the screen for this special message for them. Good morning. You know, when I was a child, I loved to go to the library. My mom would let me walk there all by myself. I had a goal of reading every book, and I started at one shelf and I tried to work my way through all of the shelves. I don't really remember how far I got, but I know I didn't reach my goal. I never read every book in the library. The Bible is like a library of books about God. There are 66 books in total in the Bible that we use. Imagine 66 scrolls combined together, each having a different author, or some authors may have wrote more than one of those scrolls, one of those books. They're divided up into two sections, the Old Testament, and those are the scrolls that tell about God and God's people before Jesus came. And then the New Testament, the books that tell of Jesus and the people who followed him and became the, became the church in the years after. We say that these are God's words because these are the testimonies or the stories of people who are interacting with God through the Holy Spirit. These are not the only stories of God working in the world. You have a story of God working in your life through you and through how you love others. I have a story too. And when we tell our story and share how God loves us, it's as if we're adding to the Bible. We're adding to the stories that we share what we know about God. And we can learn so much about God and God's love when we read the Bible. And we learn about God too when we tell our stories or listen to other stories like we're doing to get today together. I hope that you are courageous and share your God stories with your friends and your family. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for how you have been a part of the human story all along. You showed us your love through all the people of the Bible, and you still show us your love today through our family, our friends, and our neighbors. Help us to share our God stories and share your love with the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I mentioned earlier that we would be continuing our Hitting the Book series. We're having a guest speaker today. His name is Lance Pyburn. He's a member of St. Luke. He's actually our co-chair or our vice chair of our church council. He's a dynamic young person and I am so pleased that he's giving his message today. He's sharing his thoughts on a book called Traveling Mercies by Anne Lamott. I started reading it in anticipation of his message and I resonated so much with so many of the experiences that Anne shares. And I know as you listen to Lance's message today, you will be moved and transformed. His message is a traveling mercy for us all today. Friends, let us pray as we begin to hear this message. Beautiful one, be present with us as we are blessed by Lance's message today, by his sharing. Help us to hear, to understand and be transformed by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Lance and I am the Vice Chair of the Church Council here at St. Luke. When Bonnie first reached out about the Hitting the Book series, she included a couple of prompts on how to go about selecting a book, um, with one being choose a book and share how that writing had shaped or impacted your faith. The answer to that question was a no-brainer for me, partially because I'm not the biggest reader, which means that any book that I read cover to cover is probably gonna have a lasting impact on my life, but also because out of the handful of books that I've read, <laughs> there's been one book that I've been coming back to repeatedly over the course of the last 13 years or so, specifically on guidance, on faith, and how to interact with others in this world. That book is Traveling Mercies by Anne Lamott, and it's a collection of nonfiction essays that chronicle Anne's life, as well as some of her thoughts on faith. Now, I quickly realized that thinking of the book was going to be the easy part once I sat down to think through what message I was gonna be sharing exactly. 
I've ran into this dilemma a handful of times in my life when I've suggested the book to family or friends for them to potentially pick up and read themselves. What's the book about? They'd ask. Well, it's just stories about her life and um, thoughts on faith. That description felt adequate, rarely felt adequate, if not completely underwhelming. It's not exactly the type of review that would make someone who wasn't familiar with Anne or her style of writing want to rush out and buy the book. It also seemed like the person's own definition and connection to the word faith was a strong determining factor on whether or not they'd be interested in having a further conversation about the book at all. So with all that in mind, I've decided to share a few pieces of my life to give some context on what was going on each time I came to Anne's words for guidance or comfort and share a few examples of how it shaped my faith before ending with some traveling mercies of my own to you in this, our year of 2020. The first time I picked up Traveling Mercies was in my very, very late teens. I had just started to look at Christian literature that might be able to help fill in some of the gaps in areas I felt like my current understanding was lacking based off what I had experienced in the real world during my first year of college. And Traveling Mercies had been mentioned as an inspiration for one of those first writers I picked up. I remember having trouble finding a copy of the book in the local bookstore with there being a bit of a discrepancy on whether it was classified as memoir or Christian literature, given how irreverent Anne's thoughts can be. I also was still a bit skeptical as to whether a book seemingly about nothing other than ordinary life would be worth my time or offer any insight into all of the big problems that I was needing help sorting out. My time reading the book, or my first time reading the book rather, continues this trend of my expectations being subverted by everything that Anne wrote and represented. The first section of the book is labeled an overture, where Anne walks us through her backstory of growing up outside of San Francisco in Marin County her family life, and her early interactions with folks of various faiths before eventually joining a church later in life herself. I thought it was pretty boring my first time through, I'm going to be honest. Um, My thought was, where was the big advice on how to live a perfect life of faith, I kept thinking. Truth be told, I skimmed through it to get to the later sections where each chapter was a nicely contained essay with themes and a message because I believed the mumbled storytelling of the overture was not worth my time. Looking back at the worldview that I held at the time of that reading, it only makes sense that this was my initial response to Anne. Folks who listened to my talk on why I believe in miracles, know that I grew up in a small town in rural Texas where the preaching extended far beyond the pulpits of the various churches to make up the fabric of small town culture. What that meant is that ideas on who was admirable and what type of behavior was desirable were all heavily influenced by a fundamental and evangelical Christian belief system whether the topic at hand was directly related to church or not. All that to say is that everything that I had been taught and observed about Christianity led me to believe that Anne Lamont shouldn't be an authority on the subject. I was used to strong or good Christians speaking out confidently about their faith in somewhat generalized um, and maybe overly simplistic platitudes, mind you. (laughs) But even if you did have doubt or setbacks along the way, you would make sure to note that there was minor stumbles on a path that you strongly believe to be predetermined by God. Anne, however, describes her journey to faith as a series of staggers on lily pads that she used to move across a swamp of doubt and fear. In the overture, she shares that she grew up in a non-religious household where she and her brothers were raised to believe in books, music, and nature. 
Her parents were social justice oriented and taught their children to believe that they had a moral obligation to try to save the world and frequently volunteered and donated to help out with various causes. They also had high expectations for Anne in school that she notes by sharing that it wasn't until she was 35 that she learned that a B plus actually was a pretty good grade. She also shares that drinking was fairly common in her childhood home, both at parties and otherwise, and that she also started taking part in that activity and trying out other types of substances at an early age. Her parents' marriage was strained and ultimately ended in divorce after years of hardship and some infidelity. It's interesting to read through the book now and see how my life and Anne's were virtually opposite in almost every conceivable way, except for how we viewed ourselves. This is evidenced by Anne sharing that a friend's mother, who was a Christian scientist, which her father described as so crazy that they actually made Catholics look good, stuck out to Anne as being different because she would tell Anne that she was a perfect child and that she was entirely good and that everything was fine. All evidence to the contrary, according to Anne. Unlike Anne Lamont, I had been given a set of operating instructions in the Christian belief system that provided me with steps on how to be a good person and how to do life in the right way. Unfortunately, the operating manual I had been given also clearly spelled out that who I was at my very core as a queer human was wrong. And no amount of checking boxes by doing everything right was going to change that. I was beginning to realize that there would truly never be a place for me within the Christian framework as I understood it. This is why Anne's words about never speaking up or speaking out about uncomfortable things in her life resonated with me so much, even at that first time of reading. She shared that she didn't tell a soul about anything that could have been perceived as bad because she wanted to be loved. She wrote that she stood around silently, bursting with hopes and secrets and fear, all skin, bone, and eyes. Anne rounds out her overture by sharing about publishing her first novel, losing her father to an aggressive form of cancer within a small three-year period, and her struggles with alcohol and substance abuse. She shared how she struggled financially during this time, staying with a friend and living in a small houseboat, as well as her experiences sleeping with men who almost always seemed to be married. She concludes the section with stories of how her wandering ultimately led her to a church in Marin City, across from a dusty flea market. She shares how over the course of many months, she went from just standing in the back to staying through the song service, to ultimately staying through every single sermon until she finally joined the church. Now, not too long after reading Traveling Mercies for that first time, I made the decision to silently foreclose on Christianity and stop considering myself to be a Christian. I stopped attending church other than those few obligatory appearances I needed to make with family every now and then just to not cause any waves. I had grown tired of standing around silently, bursting with hope and secrets and fear while trying to accomplish enough in order to prove myself worthy of being accepted as I was. I'd also began to realize that the evangelical worldview I'd grown up with didn't align with how I believe I wanted to treat others and what was truly important in this life. Now, for whatever reason, Anne wasn't excluded from my life like all other Christian writers and thought leaders during that time. No matter what she called herself or whether she went to church or not, her willingness to be vulnerable with what she shared about her life has let me see enough similarities in our stories 
to know that she and her patchwork god sewn together from bits of rag and ribbon, Eastern and Western, pagan and Hebrew, meant no harm to me. And so I carried Anne and her thoughts on faith with me as a continual guide on how to treat others during my sabbatical from Christianity and organized religion. The next handful of times that I read through Traveling Mercies was during my 20s, which was during college and into my first couple of professional jobs. During this time, as I peeled away from the things I had been taught my life should look like as a Christian in terms of how I should behave and interact with others, I kept coming back to Anne. I was essentially flying blind since all of the morals and ethics I had learned to live by were tied up in Bible stories and an evangelical belief system that I had left behind. And while I knew I wanted to make changes to my worldview, I didn't have all the answers on what exact changes to make. And stories of befriending a Buddhist neighbor and regular references of how she couldn't stand being in the same room as Christians for most of her life heavily influenced my initial decisions of what changes I wanted to make. I was determined to do everything in my power to not be perceived as Christian, or as Anne put it, someone so hostile in their belief that they are saved and that others were not. What that looked like um, in my day-to-day was no longer having expectations that another person needed to maintain the same belief system as me in order for us to be friends or that we didn't have to agree on what was going to happen after this world is over for me to see them as a worthy human. Like Anne, who found community in college with folks with different beliefs than hers, I started to make friends with folks of all walks and beliefs including atheists and agnostics. As we grew in our friendships, I learned how they viewed the world and how they thought about concepts of morality and ethics without a Christian backdrop. And I slowly started to love myself more in the process. It was during this stretch of life that Anne's story about what she thought might have been a small miracle in her church started to hit home for me. A gay man named Ken had recently joined her church after attending with a Jewish woman who came every week for the community despite not believing in Jesus herself. Ken lost his partner shortly after joining and was slowly dying of AIDS himself. A member of the choir named Renala, who Anne describes as large and beautiful and jovial and black and devout as can be, was regularly standoffish towards Ken, looking at him with confusion when she chose to look at him at all. Anne shares that Renola was raised in the South by Baptists who taught her that his way of life, or rather that he himself was an abomination and that it was hard for her to break through that teaching to truly see Ken. Anne shares that she thinks that Renala had a handful of other women at the church um, who might actually have been afraid of catching AIDS from Ken. Over the course of the chapter, Ken wins over a majority of the congregation by sharing his story, all while his health continues to decline. One morning, when the entire congregation is standing and singing, his eye is on the sparrow, Anne caught Renola watching Ken sing from a seat. Anne shared that Renola's face began to melt and contort with emotion before she walked over to bend down and lift him up. Renola held him next to her, draped over her shoulder against her like a child, while they sang with tears streaming down both of their faces. Now this story of a small and seemingly ordinary miracle became somewhat of a North Star in my life 
the idea that we as humans could overcome what we had been taught about one another in order to see past the otherness and see ourselves reflected in each other's faces was a powerful concept. Seeing other examples of this ever so often in my daily life has restored my faith in humanity countless times. And thanks to Anne, I was looking for it in so many places other than inside the walls of a church. Now fast forward to present day, and it's pretty clear that I did end up joining a church here at St. Luke. It wasn't because I felt like it was something that I should do in order to become someone that I was not, though. It was just because, like Anne, I simply wanted to join a community of faith, and I'm so thankful for y'all for welcoming and accepting me just as I am. The last handful of times I've read this book, I find myself finding more humor in Anne's words and how most of my outlook and worldview has changed. Like Anne, I at one point believed that all adults had some kind of inner toolbox full of shiny tools like the saw of discernment, the hammer of wisdom, or the sandpaper of patience. But now that I'm very much an adult myself who interacts with other adults on a regular basis, I agree with Anne that it feels like life simply just handed us some rusty, bent old tools like friendships, prayer, conscience, honesty, and said, do your best that you can with these. They will have to do. And mostly, against all odds, they're enough. At this point, I've deconstructed many aspects of my faith. That process has been shaped by my own experiences of being othered by church and myself so much so that much of my lived faith now centers around simply not doing that to other people. What that means is that I don't believe faith is about forcing the way that I live my life on others in any capacity. If anything, it's simply meeting them where they're at and still working to see God in them. At one point, I believed living out my faith meant working to change the hearts and minds of those who still lived under that more narrow and unforgiving worldview that I used to hold. This cookie cutter Christianity that has been scaled and mass marketed over decades and generations to provide hope, security, and self-assuredness. Kind of like the stock Hallmark cards that you buy at the grocery store. The problem I identified with that approach was that it was just like my previous outlook before I even read Traveling Mercies to begin with. Change your belief system to meet mine and we'll all get along fine. What I've realized in my last couple of times reading the book is that Anne never outlines what someone should believe or a right way to practice their faith. She simply shares stories of her own. With that said, I am starting to believe that living out my faith means finding folks who have been cast aside either outright or by denying themselves through small acts of cutting off and repressing parts of who we are to fit into this perfect Christian narrative and encouraging them to live authentically, to share their stories authentically to name the trauma and the harm that has been caused by bad theology mixed with human fear, shame, and hate, to cry with them, to lift them up, and to let them know that we are enough. Now, the term Traveling Mercies does come to play in the book as the title of one of the essays in the section about church and people. Anne shares that it's a phrase that the old people at her church say when someone goes off for a while. Traveling mercies, love the journey, God is with you, come home safe and sound. She opens the chapter by sharing how broken things felt in her life and the lives of people she loved at the time of the writing. She even shares that Ken, who she had spoke about and written about previously, had passed away at this portion of the book. Um, she then, uh, 
concludes though by saying traveling morsies uh, to the mother of a dear friend as they took their last breath in their home in San Francisco. In this way, Anne continues to subvert what many folks, myself included, have come to think of certain Christian sayings and phrases. The essay is by no means saccharine and overtly positive. And while she does share a couple of silver linings, they are just as quiet and as unassuming as Anne can be herself. Now, 2020 has certainly been unpredictable, given that we are more than six months into a global pandemic. While the impacts on each of us might be different from an economic, health, and social perspective, all of us are being impacted in some way. I think it's important to realize that in addition to the health and economic impacts of the virus, it also brings something else to our attention more regularly in our day to day. And that is running into instances where people might make different choices than us based off of potentially different beliefs. I know it can be disorienting when you run into that type of situation, depending on how you're feeling, or a variety of other things that are going on with you that day. I'm going to take a cue from Anne by not pretending I have the answer as to what is the right thing to be done in a situation like that. But what I will do is share what has helped me in similar instances over my life, just like Anne would. So in those moments, when I run into someone who views the world and chooses to live their life in a very different way than me. Maybe so much so that they even overtly tell me that the way that I'm doing it is wrong. It's easy to get caught up in absolutes about how you should always do this thing because that is the obvious choice. And it's really easy to completely diminish the other person in that process. And what I have found is that when I stop and hold space in that moment to recognize that life does have subtle undertones of hope, I can start to see past the otherness, to find parts of myself reflected in that person. This puts me in a better mental space to still remember to see the human in front of me and detach their humanity from their actions and beliefs, which help me act in ways that I would hope someone else would handle me if the situation were reversed. So no matter what comes our way as we continue throughout this year, I wish you traveling mercies along the way. Traveling mercies, live authentically, practice empathy, Create space for yourself and others. God is with you. Come home safe and sound. Thank y'all all so much for giving me your time this morning. I hope you have a blessed rest of your Sunday. Thank you, Lance, for sharing your own story with authenticity and courage. It truly is in sharing our stories and our lives with one another that we become love for the world. And thank you, Lance, for how you've encouraged us to be thoughtful as we encounter the humans around us each day, seeing them as human rather than other. Beloved friends, let us sing together what a friend we have in Jesus as a response to Lance's message. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we Carry everything to God.
God in prayer. Have we trials and tribulations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful? sorrow share. Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find a solace there. Just an announcement before we close our service today. Starting in two weeks, I will be leading a study group through a, a study about what it means to be missional or sent and incarnational or embodied people of faith. Like the people that Anne Lamott writes about, how do we become people of love and grace to everyone we meet? It's loosely based on a resource called the Tangible Kingdom Primer, and it'll take place over nine weeks, ending the week before Thanksgiving. There is a daily exercise or a practice, and then once a week we'll meet via Zoom to reflect on our experiences. I would love for you to join with me. We'll have a link in the epistle so that you can join in, or you can send me an email to get more information. As our closing hymn today, let us sing, Jesus Walked This Lonesome Valley. Jesus walked this lonesome valley, he had to walk it by himself. Oh, nobody else could walk it for him, he had to walk it by himself. We must walk this lonesome valley, we have to walk it by ourselves. Oh, nobody else can walk it for us. We have to walk it by ourselves. You must walk and stand your trial. You have to stand it by yourself. Oh, nobody else can stand it for you. Friends, hear this blessing as we end. Beloveds, though there is much in this world we cannot control, the power we have is sacred and true. In partnership with God, through practices of honesty and confession, through extensions of mercy, through resistance that heals and transforms, we glimpse the heavens and the kingdom draws near. In the company of the Spirit, we are sent to join the menders of the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us sing together as our closing song, The Irish Blessing, and may you all go in peace today. May the road rise up to meet you, may the wind be always at your May the sun shine warm on your face and the 